Hey, what's up guys? Mr. Foster here again. And this week we're learning all about adaptations. Okay, we're gonna head to the park and we're gonna jump right on in. So while you're thinking about why it might be important for us to know about things like adaptations, I want you to think about how you use your hands every single day. Think about that and then we'll come back together and we'll kind of talk about why adaptations are important. So here I am out at the park to try and observe different animals and organisms to see if I can notice any adaptations. All right. As I'm looking around, I can see there's different trees. I see a little duck in the pond, which is really starting to get my mind going. And then as I continue my walk, I also noticed that there were some weeds and things like that growing up through the cracks in the ground. And it made me wonder, how are these different organisms adapting to their surrounding environments? What do you guys think? All right, guys, now that we are back from the park, I really want to know what do you think in terms of how those animals and organisms may have adapted to their environment? Hmm. Well, first, let's actually go back a step and let's define what an adaptation actually is. So, an adaptation is basically the process and, uh, that enables organisms to adjust to their environment in order to ensure survival. So what does that mean? Basically, an organism is gonna change either the way that it acts and behaves, or it's gonna change biologically, meaning its physical makeup is actually going to change in order to help it survive in its environment. So when we were at the park, we had the opportunity to see a, a range of different organisms, everything from plant life to even one little small animal. Even though it was way, way out there in the lake, it was kind of hard to see. We could still see it, it was a duck. Ducks actually have webbed feet. And then those webbed feet allow them to swim faster in the water. It helps to move them quickly and swiftly, either to escape from predators or to help them catch their prey when they're hunting for different, maybe small fish and bugs or things of that nature. So now let's go back to the question I asked you guys at the very beginning. Why, one, why would it be important for us to know about adaptations? And then two, how do you use your hands in your day-to-day -day lives? Well, it's important for us to know about adaptations because it's gonna teach us as to how different organisms survive. Organisms including ourselves. We use our hands on a day-to-day -day basis to do a wide range of things. For instance, I can use them to clap. I can use them to do stuff like this and make funny faces and crazy stuff. But speaking more so in terms of survival, we have things called opposable thumbs. Not many animals have these. We are one of the few uh, species that do, and we use them in order to survive. We can use them to hunt, we use them to climb, we use them to help us uh, when we're grabbing different things, things like that. So these right here are super important in terms of our survival. So as we're working this week, there's gonna be some questions that we're gonna to wanna to be able to answer. So those thinking questions that I would like for you to really focus on as we're going through are gonna be, what are adaptations? How do they help organisms survive in specific environments? What are some examples of plant and animal structures and functions? How are some animals better suited to live on land than others? How are some organisms better adapted to live in water? So as we're going through, I really want you guys to think about those questions there and how they apply for adaptations this week. All right guys, so we have three major key concepts. One, plants and animals have specific structures and functions that enable them to be successful in specific environments. Two, examples of structures that enables animals to survive in their environments are the hooves of bison, the webbed feet of ducks, and the claws of squirrels. So you'll have different structures or body parts that are really gonna help animals survive in the areas in which they live. Three, the thumb. Pow, 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 pow is an important structure that enables human beings to survive. This is one of the biggest things uh, that we use in order to get by. Uh, don't wrestle myself. <laughs> anyway, let's move on. So we talked about this a little bit earlier, but adaptations, why are they important? Adaptations help plants and animals and people, all organisms survive. It's all about survival at the end of the day. It's all about surviving, okay? 
one of the first scientists to really understand or start to study these things was the English naturalist Charles Darwin. He realized over 150 years ago that physical features or their structures and how they are used, the function of those structures, took many generations to develop. He observed that those species of animals and plants that were able to survive and reproduce were those that had best adapted to the challenges of their environments. So basically, they changed in order to survive. He called this natural ability to adapt natural selection. So when you're able to adapt, that's called natural selection. When you're able to adapt, that's natural selection. That's how I like to think of it, okay? And then going back to some of those uh, hot key vocabulary words, we also have our structures. The structures are gonna be your physical features. Those are your things like your thumbs, hands, um, the way that your legs and stuff are set up, things like that. The function of those features is uh, what's gonna tell us how they're able to survive. So for example, a crocodile has a really long mouth, which helps him to swallow larger prey and things like that, as well as a lot of teeth and a really, really powerful biting force, all right? So the biting force is how much pressure that animal is allowed, or able to rather, bite with okay so those types of functions the amount of pressure he's able to apply help him survive because then he can catch more prey he can catch a larger prey because he can apply more force things like that those are adaptations that have helped animals survive for years and years just like animals have adaptations so do plants so for example in the rainforest when there's uh so much heavy green foliage the competition isn't for water there's plenty of water available it rains so much there but it's for sunlight and since all these plants are constantly competing for sunlight some plants have adapted by growing taller and much faster than their neighboring plants to reach that sunlight those plants that are in like deep shaded areas will have much darker green leaves and red leaves to absorb as much sunlight as possible in arctic regions Although there's plenty of sunlight during the summer, the wind blows so, so strong and unmercifully in the protected landscape, or I'm sorry, in the unprotected landscape. So as a result of that, the trees grow much, much lower to the ground. So then that way, they won't get blown away from the strong, strong winds. Some of those trees are so, so short that they're only a few inches tall. And then that helps them to uh, stay grounded with their roots deep into the ground. So then that way they don't get uprooted and blown away. All right, plants are also smaller than similar species at lower altitudes because of a shorter growing season farther north. Farther north you go, a little bit colder, so it's not as long of a growing season, which means they're gonna be much smaller. There are many factors to determine which adaptations will ensure survival. So for example, plants release moisture through their leaves. However, in the desert where water is scarce, plants like cacti have leaves that resemble sharp spines so that a minimum amount of leaf surface area is exposed to transpiration, or basically so that way they don't lose as much water. The spines also act as a protection since the cacti are so, so uh, rich in water under uh, like that waxy coating and everything like that. <clears throat> Cacti can store uh, gallons and gallons of water in their trunks to be used sparingly during periods of no rain, so when there's a drought. Desert plants have roots that spread wide and extend deep into the ground to capture every valuable drop of water. Even a house plant, when placed near sunlight, will grow toward the light source and adapt <clears throat> and an adaptation to its environment. Every part of a plant, root, stem or trunk, leaf, flower, or fruit is vital to the survival of the plant and as such has been adapted to respond to the effects of the environment around it. So animals have a wide range of adaptations, everything from feet to limbs to mouths and even some defense mechanisms that will help them out as they're going through trying to survive in their environment. We kind of spoke earlier about one type of uh, foot adaptation that happens in different birds, such as ducks, to where they have webbed feet. Can you think of any other animal besides birds that might have some type of foot adaptation in order to help it survive? I'll give you a few moments to go ahead and think about that. What other animals have feet adaptations to help it survive or help them survive?
All right, if you guys said things like horses, goats, or antelopes, you would be correct because they all have hooves. They use those hooves in order to help them survive. Animals too are products or reflections of their environments. Many animals that live in an aquatic environment have webbed feet to aid in swimming in both cold and warm water, such as frogs and ducks, which is what we were talking about earlier. Beyond that, many water uh, fowl feet such as those of ducks and geese, and even polar bear and otter feet are webbed. The flaps between um, the toes, those flaps of skin, those are webbed feet and allow the animal to push against the water, which helps to give them a greater force for faster swimming to either catch food or to escape from predators. Sharp claws are an adaptation of many animals that need running speed, climbing ability, digging prowess, or hunting skills. Many of those sharp claws can be used to help them climb, help them rip through other animals' flesh if they're hunting and things like that, like tigers and lions, things of that nature. Or when they're running really fast, it helps them grip onto the ground, kind of like cleats for football or soccer or even baseball and track. All right, so then, Hooves on horses and antelopes or goats and things like that allow them to run faster and more easily over harder grounds, like hard prairie grounds where we have those wide open fields and things like that. A hoof is simply one large modified toenail. So imagine if instead of you having skin on the bottom of your foot, you just had a large toenail. When you walked around, it wouldn't hurt as much, right? Because we might not even really need as much uh, chews with something like that because it would be such a hard surface on the bottom of our foot. So that modified toenail that supports the entire foot and leg helps them when running um, in large prairies. The sucker-like feet on maybe say a gecko lizard, how they're sticky and things like that, allow it to clean the objects, to hide from predators or to wait for food. The grasping feet of tree monkeys allow them to swing from limb to limb. Just like us, monkeys and different uh, primates also have opposable thumbs on their hands and then they can also grab with their feet as well. That helps them to climb and jump from trees, uh, go and get different food sources that may be higher up and things of that nature. So we just talked about feet adaptations. Now let's talk about limb adaptations. So. When we think about limbs, you can think of like arms or wings or feet and legs, things like that. So how might um, a bird having wings help it compared to us having arms? How might those two things be different? Okay, so of course, limbs on a bird, the wings are gonna help it to fly, depending on what kind of bird it is. If we take something, for example, like a penguin, those flippers are actually going to help them in the water and allow them to swim very fast. Something else that has flippers that would help it swim very fast would be things like um, seals and things like that. They use those flippers in order to help them swim extremely fast. Well, us, we have our arms, which help us pick up large objects, things like that. We can reach over, we can grab different things. Our arms are gonna help us in many different ways, all right? The strong back legs of rabbits, so we're also talking about the limbs, um, talking about like legs and things like that. So the strong back legs of rabbits, kangaroos, and cheetahs, those allow animals to leap around and, long, and run for really long distances, either to escape predators or to catch their prey. So cheetahs are one of the fastest animals on land. Their legs actually help them to move extremely fast, but then their tails um, help them with balancing and turning. And then they also have those claws in order to grip into the ground and really move when they're chasing after their prey. Then they're using that tail to keep their balance. So you can see how all these limbs and all of these structures have different functions that help them for their overall survival. All right, so we've talked about feet adaptations. We've talked about limb adaptations. Now let's kind of dive a little bit deeper into mouth adaptations. So we know that there are different classifications of animals such as carnivores, herbivores, and omnivores. All right, so an animal's teeth will often indicate its source of food. Sharp teeth, when they really have those deep fangs and th things like that, sharp teeth reveal a carnivore. So 
most carnivores are going to have really sharp teeth. They're going to be a meat eater. While broad, flat teeth, when they have like not a lot of sharp teeth and they're pretty flat all throughout, what do you think um, that type of animal is going to be? If carnivores have sharp teeth, which are used to tear through flesh and eat different types of meat and things like that, what kind of animals would have flat teeth? to where when they're chewing, it's mostly gonna be like a grinding type of motion or something like that. What kind of animal or animals will have flat teeth? What do you guys think? Take like five more seconds. Okay, so flat teeth are gonna be for grinding food and that belongs to the Herbivore, if you guessed the herbivore, you would be correct. Herbivores eat a lot of plants, just like cows. Cows have really flat teeth. They're gonna do a lot of grinding in order to break up that plant material. Now I bet you're thinking, well, Mr. Foster, what about birds? Because they don't really have sharp teeth or grinding teeth. They have beaks. What do they do? Well, the beaks of birds vary according to their diet. So they're gonna have smaller or bigger beaks depending on what they eat and where they get it from. So for example, the crane, <coughs> oh man, excuse me. The crane has a really long, narrow beak to reach deep into water for small fish. Whereas a finch, which is a much smaller bird, has a short, powerful beak for cracking things like nuts and seeds. Predator birds, such as eagles and hawks, have curved beaks, which are very sharp for tearing chunks of flesh from their prey. Another type of bird that would have something like that would be certain types of scavengers, like vultures. They also have curved beaks because they're coming around, they're getting the dead uh, material from different animals and things like that. So they're also tearing that flesh with their curved, sharp beak. Another thing about uh, birds of prey, such as hawks and eagles, they have giant talons, really sharp claws, which when they swoop down to pick up prey, it'll help them lock onto it. So then that way they can carry it and it can also be used as a tool to tear away flesh so then they can eat it all at the same time. So let's think about defense adaptations. What type of animals will use a defense adaptation in order to help it survive okay so some types of defense adaptations are going to be things like camouflage mimicry uh, the ability to kind of like look bigger you ever seen a cat when it hisses up and it has that arch in its back well what's it what it's actually trying to do is assert itself and make itself look bigger and that's a defense mechanism or defense adaptation, okay? So by having a color or shape that blends with the environment, that's a camouflage. The organism is better hid from different predators and enemies, and it can also use that camouflage to stalk its prey. A lizard can change skin color to blend in with its environment. So if you ever think about like a chameleon or something like that, it can actually change its skin tone to blend in with its environment, okay? <clears throat> you have things like a baby deer, which will have spots to hide from different predators. So those little white spots and things like that helps it to blend in to the forest. An Arctic hare, which is white in the winter, will blend in with the snow, okay? Those Arctic hares, they have the white fur, the white coats. It'll really help them blend in to the snow so then that way they can hide from the predators that are constantly hunting it. All right, sometimes an animal can resemble another organism or its surroundings to better survive. This is called mimicry. Some insects look like leaves, while other insects re uh, resemble like a stick to hide themselves. Um, there's different like prey mantises and things like that that will do this often. They'll look like different sticks or uh, other animals, or I'm sorry, or other insects, and then that way they can hide themselves for them to have a better chance to either catch their prey or to hide from different predators. The dragon seahorse resembles like a leafy aquatic plant in order to hide from predators as well. Some animals try to appear larger to scare off predators, such as the cat arching its back. Okay, so the last type of adaptation that we're going to talk about are temperature adaptations. So I want you to think, would you go outside right now with a thick, heavy winter coat on? 
No, right? Why not? Because it's hot outside, of course. We have adapted to the temperature. We know when it's hot outside, we can wear things like short sleeves and shorts. Compared to when it's cold outside, we might want to wrap ourselves up in a nice thick coat, okay? That's one temperature adaptation that people have already come accustomed to. When we think about animals that have adapted to temperature adaptations, we can think of things, or I'm sorry, we can think of animals that live in the North and South Poles, like polar bears or seals that have these really, really thick layers of blubber. That's gonna be like really thick layers of fat underneath their skin, and that protects them from icy, frigid waters and the freezing uh, areas in which they live. In comparison though, on the opposite end, in hot desert environments, animals have adapted to a small size, such as the kangaroo mouse or thick skins such as scorpions to prevent water loss, all right? So you'll have larger animals in the colder areas where they have uh, thick layers of blubber and things like that. Even penguins, even though they're smaller, they still have some of that blubber and stuff to help them in those cold conditions. So where things like scorpions and uh, different lizards that live out in the desert are going to have harder, drier skin in order to help lock moisture in and also protect them from the sun. So migration or the seasonal movement of an organism from one place to another. So when things migrate, when they move from one environment to the next, that's an adaptation to extreme temperatures and reduced food supplies during the winter. Many birds migrate, migrate to southern areas to wait out frigid temperatures. So when you see like it's starting to get cold maybe in certain areas, they'll go to more southern areas or tropical areas so then that way they don't have to worry about the freezing, freezing cold, all right? Um, the monarch butterfly travels to central Mexico over thousands of miles during the winter. And then the Arctic tern, the gray whale, and African elephant are other examples of animals that migrate long distances due to seasonal changes. Hibernation, or for example, like when a bear or something like that goes to sleep for a really, really long time, um, is another adaptation to seasonal changes. So bears, bats, squirrels, frogs, all those types of animals that can slow down their metabolism or their body functions, how fast they absorb food, to hibernate during the winter. So when they're stocking up on all the food and stuff like that during the winter time, it's in order to survive during the long winter seasons. All right, so in conclusion, adaptations are for animal survival. We have many different types of adaptations, not only animal survival, but also plant survival because both plants and animals can uh, go through adaptations. You can have behavioral adaptations where they change the way that they act in order to survive, such as um, finding a new food source or something like that. Or you can have uh, biological adaptations, which are gonna change the actual body structure, all right? There are different types of adaptations that we covered. You have limb adaptation, you have feet adaptation, defense adaptation, mouth adaptation, as well as temperature adaptation. All of these things come together in order to help the survival of those different species of plants and animals. I want you guys now to think about what major adaptation that we talked about earlier is going to truly reinforce our survival as human beings. What either mouth adaptation, limb adaptation, temperature adaptation uh, is really going to have, feet adaptation is really gonna have the biggest impact on our survival, all right? Once you kind of have your own answer, you can type it in in the comments down below, all right? It's been great seeing you guys. I will see you all on Thursday. Have an awesome day.